if I poured you a drink, would you sit down and talk with me? Lend me your ear and I'll bring you along. We can split the day rate 50 50. Oh, baby, I get by. Oh, and all I need is something. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna get high. Welcome to the Pro EDU Podcast. Talk and drink with your favorite artist. So grab yourself a cold sarsaparilla, take your pants off, kick back, and enjoy. What about you? I'll take comfort in that. It's Black Friday, and if you're an American, you're probably stuffed and tired and laying on the couch. Uh, but Travis <laughs> is here. Uh, Travis Pattenaud is a photo dog activist, dog activist, Spanish dog activist. How would you introduce yourself? Uh, the best way to describe it is I'm a voice for the hunting dogs of Spain. So I kind of use specific thing ever, and I love it. Yep. So a lot of it, I just kind of. Looked at photo activism because you have the photojournalist documentary, and I think activism is the other side of it that we have a very specific thing to say, and we have a narrative that we're trying to push with that compared to documentary and photojournalism. So that's kind of where I kind of like to use the activism side, but mainly it is I'm a voice for the hunting dogs of Spain. All right. And, and why the hunting dogs of Spain? Uh, me and my wife, we've been with Greyhound Rescue for a long time. We heard about an article about the Greyhound or the Galgos. And after we adopted our very first Galgo named Lena and learning more about her history, uh, we knew we had to do more. So kind of a uh, little brief thing about the Galgos is the fact that Galgos are used for hunting her in Spain and the hunting season from October to February. And basically, every year in Spain, about 100,000 galgos are killed or abandoned each year. So the hunters will, yes. So the hunters will breed them. If they do not good, do good that season, they will dump the dogs, keep five of them, four females, one male, breed them, and start over again. So they just will keep mass breeding in hopes to find the next champion. Instead of focusing on training, they just mass breed. Hopefully, one of them will become the champion. Oh my lord! So a, a hundred thousand—that is, a, I never would have thought that was a number. That yeah, it's for a while that we kind of we were questioning it, but my friend who did a documentary on the Galgos was able to help verify a lot of this. And there's a lot that we don't actually get to see because a lot of hunters will kill them off and dump them to where people don't find them. So. My friend found a uh, burial ground with about 25 dogs in there and documented that. Uh, I found a couple of burial grounds with the dogs. So it's they're out there and it's in the rural areas where you probably won't see most of it. So, but the shelter I was just at, they have, when I was there, they had 650 dogs in that shelter. Oh Lord. And they're all the, the same Galgos type yeah, dog? About 80% of them are Galgos. Oh, man. All right. So how are you using photography to bring awareness to uh, this cause, which is amazing? Uh, what When I first started out, I we started an adoption group. And obviously, with the adoption group, we have to take photos to help get the dogs adopted. So what happened with that is we had a member from Heart Speak come out and take photos of the dogs. And looking at her photos, I was like, okay, I suck. I really need to figure out how to take some better pictures of this. And as I started learning, 
what I came up, I wanted to find a way to spread awareness quicker for these dogs because most people have never heard of these dogs. They're kind of one of the most persecuted dog breeds in the world and no one's ever heard of them. So my original goal of this was to, since I didn't think I could ever be good in photography, was to try to get other pet photographers to take photos of them. If I could get maybe half of the interest as they do with the pit bulls and the bullies, the photographers that do that, then maybe we could spread awareness a lot quicker since all of those photographers, their followers are animal lovers too. And that would help spread it out a lot quicker. But as I learned more about photography, I fell more in love with it. And I just kept going and going. And before I realized that, okay, I could actually be halfway decent with this and just started using that to kind of help tell the story and bring emotion to the, these dogs. Yeah. So are you doing this now completely full time? And is this like your main source of income or do you kind of do a lot of different stuff? Uh, mainly I do have a full time job. So this is all part time. I do it while I can. I get to visit Spain uh, two weeks out of the year. So airfare has gone up. It's getting harder to fly out there as needed. So I, the two weeks I'm out there, I try to get as much as I can done while I'm out there. But with the dogs we bring over, when I was first starting out, a lot of the photos I was taking were of our foster dogs. So I was kind of working with them, uh, which helped because a lot of these dogs are very traumatized and have PTSD. So it's building that bond with the dog so I can get photos of them. So having them as a foster dog helped me build that bond. So when I brought them into the studio, it made it much easier to take those photos. Then uh, just from that helped me expand my photography. And then when I go to Spain, I kind of take more of a photojournalistic style with the dogs, kind of capture them in the studio, go on rescues and capture that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is such a huge task that you've brought on, uh, and I love it. But like, how do you know that whatever you're doing is working? Do you have, you know, other organizations? Are you, you know, setting goals? Is there just like a, a number that uh, you're looking, you know, to, to yeah, get? When I when I first started out, I kind of never realized I'd get to this point, but I would kind of set some basic goals. Of, hey, I would like to get a photo of a Galguana magazine. And I was able to accomplish that quickly. Then it's kind of been working from there. But where I've been noticing the big changes, I've when we have meet and greets with the dogs, I've had other photographers come up saying, hey, we saw your photography. We loved it. We had to come meet the dogs. Uh, one of the other great things that happened was during a print competition, one of my images came up and one of the judges was questioning about the dog and two of the judges came up and said, yeah, that's a Galgo from Spain. So right there it told me it's the message is getting out. People are learning about these dogs and understanding it. So it's been very helpful that way. I've done quite a few articles about the dogs. So it's been spreading awareness and that's what I love about it. Yeah, and you're bringing these dogs back to the United States, correct? Or are you also helping them get adopted in Spain? Uh, I do bring them back. Uh, me and my wife have transported and adopted about 250 dogs so far. Holy cow. So it's I just brought four back on Sunday. I was just out there for uh, nine days. So it's been a slow process of kind of building that up and getting uh, the dogs adopted here and more people learning about them. So that's what's been amazing about it. Yeah. And so you're bringing the dogs back and how are you getting people here in the United States to, to adopt a dog? So a lot of it, a lot of our adopters are past sighthound owners. So I've had greyhounds, whippets, uh, iggies, things like that. And they've learned, they've been learning about the gray, uh, the galgos, especially since greyhound racing has been declining. So they're looking for other ways to get sighthounds. So we've been doing, uh, meet and greets, uh, the articles that I've been publishing about the Galgos, different podcasts like this that people learn about and investigate more, and they see how great of dogs these can be. So yeah. that's where the, a lot of the adoptions have been coming from. Yeah. Well, I'd love to get into, uh, I mean, these photos of your dogs um, on your Instagram. I'm going to start sharing mm -hmm. my screen. I would love to just kind of hear some of these stories. All right, so everyone follow um, at stinkeye underscore photography. And there's got to be a name or a story behind this name. So where did this come from? Uh, when I first started, I want, 
after her speech came out, I took photos of our dogs. One goal I set to myself was I wanted to become a member of HeartSpeak and pay it forward. So in order to do that, I had to come up with a website. So one joke I always had is a lot of the dogs tend to give me stink eye while I'm taking photos. So <laughs> I just said, hey, I'm just going with stink eye. It's. I love it. I love it. All right. So is this, this is one of the Galgos? Yes. So this one, uh, his mom, new mom was in Spain with me. And she was from France, and he is a very terrified Galgo. His name was Leo. And she asked if I could take a portrait of him before, you know, he went home. And with this one, what I ended up having to do, he was out in the outdoor patio, and you can see he was digging a hole trying to hide from everyone. Oh. So what I ended up doing, I had my uh, 7200 and my R5, so I had it tucked under my arm, and the lens pointing out the back, and I was just walk, sneaking up behind to him backwards, and it's kind of crouched down, and it's kind of waiting for him to kind of get a little more relaxed. So using the uh, the screen, pop that up so I could kind of watch and just take that photo with my back to him. So it's a lot of just kind of giving them their space to be able to capture some of these photos. Yeah. And so this is kind of what you do in the studio with these right. dogs. Yeah, this is Mac Tub, who was adopted right before I left for Spain. Uh, this was shot with a single light. So I mainly use uh, what's called bonnet lighting. So I use a 47 inch umbrella with a white interior and just kind of place that above the dog so it comes down. So I like that look because I want the focus to be in the dog's face. Yeah. And like human portraiture, a lot of people use the Rembrandt that comes across the side because the face is more flat. With the dogs, since they have the long snout, I like the light coming down, kind of more of a shower, washing down on them. And it kind of brings that focus right to their face. Yeah. And Lord, I would adopt this dog in a heartbeat with this with this photography of him. He's adorable. Yeah, he's a he was a great dog. So he's got a great home, uh, great home now. So glad to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So. And What's the story? This looks like a very emotional and intentional photograph. So tell me about this one. Yeah, this one I created as to honor Lena, the very first Galgo we adopted. Kind of the whole story behind this is back in October of 2012, I was dealing with a very dark depression and came very close to hanging myself in my garage. Oh, man. Uh, luckily, I had a moment of clarity that kind of realized what was happening. I was able to stop myself. Um, I really didn't ex tell any of, my, any of my friends or my wife about that situation. And that weekend, we went to uh, a Greyhound reunion. And we we're talking to some volunteers. And they mentioned that there was a two Galgos that just flew into Chicago and were available for adoption. So we put in an application, harassed the group. And the following weekend, we adopted Lena. And after learning her story that she was rescued right before her hunter was going to hang her in a tree because she was no longer useful. And that irony did not get lost on me at all. That, you know, I was ready to hang myself to end my life and she was going to be hung because she, he felt she was no longer useful. Oof. So I spent the longest time trying to work with her to get her comfortable with people again. And because of that, that's kind of, help with my depression yeah. so it kind of worked that way and uh unfortunately lena passed away in april of 2015 from cancer so she was only with us for about three years but she oh. had such a profound effect on our lives so i created that image as a way to thank her for saving my life and giving me this amazing voice of photography yeah i love that all right how did you pull this off uh, this was Cinema, one of our fosters we had for a long time and perfectly named dog for Cinema because she actually loved watching TV. So huh. she would sit there and just sit and watch TV. And But uh, I was just playing around, found some a nice site that had these masks. So she would actually wear these masks. So really? it, it took a little time to kind of get her comfortable and put the mask on and she would wear it and I'd be able to get these fun portraits. So like this one with the cat and the cat mask, it's kind of the question, is it, you know, cat safe or is cat dog or 
you know, which one do you see more? Is it the dog or the cat? Yeah. <laughs> so these are so good. So do you license any of your photos? Uh, like, uh, I put some out for licensing, but I kind of found a lot of these images. They're not really good for the commercial side of things. So yeah, a lot more... of people like the bright white and clean style. I'm, I love the low key, you know, Chris Knight, you know, Pro EDU and Chris Knight's the dramatic portraits truly where I learned lighting. So I love the low key lighting. And then I kind of found uh, Tim Flack, who's another phenomenal animal for photographer. And I loved how he used the uh, emotions to kind of bring out the empathy for the dogs. So I've been combining the two of them for that. Well, this is, is this, is this a real set or is this CGI? Yeah, this is a real set. I just out in Las Vegas for a conference at Shutterhounds. And I, when I travel, I do try to find galgos in those areas so I could get photos. And this was a studio called uh, Red Door or Red Wall. And this was an actual set they had. So we brought the galgos in and kind of tried different setups with these. So they also had another fun one. It was a big spherical device that uh, Shakira used on a concert. So we had a dog in there that was able to sit and all the lights going on. And oh, this looks really cool. Yeah, it was a it was a very cool studio. And so you said Shutter Hound. So is that a, a is that a yeah, convention that, for animal photographers? Yeah, that was the first year of the uh, convention. So Kaylee Greer, I know you've had her on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she had a very first conference in September for that. Oh, okay, awesome. The coats these, on guys. Yeah, it's. I was doing. Uh, got sponsored by UAF Photo Lab, so awesome prints. So I was doing quite a few. Got a acrylics and trying to show these off from a lot of the different images and some of the different styles also Ooh, did a I... did a book with that so you know it's great prints the little uh acrylic book that i did with them where is the book available uh it's basically this is just a print for you know if i would sell uh the books to the clients so I just wanted to show off some of those uh, images through that, and UAF could have at at the uh, expos that they could show that stuff off also. Oh, awesome! So, so is this is this outside? Is this inside? This is inside. So inside. got a bunch of fake flowers. And if you go to the next one, you'll see the live the setup of it. So quite a few fake flowers. Kind of set Yima up, who's one of my galgos. It's kind of have her on there. It's kind of doing some fun portraits with her with this. So it's yeah. fun in the winter. I kind of missed the spring and summer. So kind of set up these flowers and kind of grab some of these portraits with her. Nice. And it looks like you're using a uh, Godox umbrella. Is that a Godox yep. light too? Yep. Yeah, it's a 8400. Okay. And is there diffusion under here as well? Or is it just an open? That's just an open one. So I prefer to have the white uh, inner side for it. So that adds some nice diffusion to it, but sometimes I'll switch off between using the fusion or not. Depends on how much I want to control that light for the background. Yeah. Well, I love it. It's so clean and just, it's a great, it's a great portrait. Then some of these other ones, it's, I, for my lighting, I tend to go between one light and I'll go up to five lights, depending on the dog. Uh, there's some of the wire coat dogs that, the fur tends to eat the light pretty well. Oh, yeah. So using the five lights kind of still gives me a nice rim light for that and kind of works out nicely. What is, so this is like the king of the Galgos or what? Yeah, it's another one where I wanted to kind of show their past royalty because back in the 16th century, these guys were royalty in a sense. Really? So I, with uh, AI out now, it kind of gave me that option to kind of help create these costumes for these dogs. Okay, there's, so this isn't, he's not wearing this. No. So I had uh, oh. Mid Journey create the armor for the dog, and then I composited the dog into it. 
Okay. So it's just so, another another fun way to kind of show their history. How did you get like the end? Like, was it? I know Mid Journey will give you great stuff, but it's kind of hard to get the perspective right. So how did you like fine tune? Like, uh, I had to find my through different images or set the dogs up to kind of match some of that. Okay. So it's pretty much I'll find the different armor, then try to do photos to kind of help match where the armor would be at. So did Mid Journey give you basically like an actual dog wearing this, and then like you cropped out that dog and put in a real dog? Yep. Okay. So yeah, unfortunately, Mid Journey still not that great with dogs, but I kind of figured this way I could at least get the armor and work through yeah. that stuff and have fun with that. This is incredible. I've I've kind of been waiting for the feature in Mid Journey, like where you insert, like let's say you just upload a photo of a dog and you can say like put armor on this dog, right? You know, or something like that. Just like yeah, minor tweaks would be pretty cool. Yeah, I've tried that and it doesn't even come close. <laughs> so yeah. Like, oh, I know. I know. So, but yeah, a lot of these. Uh, another fun one with Yima and her little stink eye. Oh, this is cool. Is this a yep. composite, or did all three of these dogs sit still for this? Oh, that's a composite. So this was a image I wanted to redo. It was a digital artist. I can't remember his name, uh, but I saw it, and I thought it would be a fun, cool portrait to try to do to see if I could actually do it with the live dogs. And it works in a sense for me that I do tend to show a lot of my stuff where I'm, I use the dogs to talk about my depression, things like that also. So it's kind of my way of kind of, yes, the dogs are protecting me in a sense, but I'm also talking about them. Yeah. I mean, dogs are the best. Oh, oh yeah. What is this guy doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> Yima and her fun little hat. and I want a hat like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, all right, so how did this, is, is this AI or is this no, an outfit? She was wearing that. And that was another one from uh, another artist and I'm drawing a blank on her name. She's got a whole series of these, and I loved how she did it. So I was just like, I just want to try it just to see how she did it and how it worked. So uh, I just tried to recreate it this one time just to see how it worked. So I love to find other artists and see how and kind of break down the images and see how they do it and try to recreate those. That's always the yeah. fun part of it. I love the beards on these dogs that they Oh, get. yeah. I'm a little jealous. I wish I could grow beard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. Some of them have much better birds. I can't even grow one either. So it's. <laughs> so is this? Was she wearing this or he? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll find different jewelry things. Just kind of. I'm not big on props that much, but some of the jewelry is nice to wear to have those things. So. This almost looks like uh, Splinter from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Or an, or an Ewok. Yeah. So. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's Anna, who's a Galgo Padenko mix, another one from Spain. That uh, very sweet dog, very small, but yeah, she's just got an odd coloring and odd fur to her. Yeah, I, I love it. Oh man, there's so many. So, are the Spanish authorities aware of this problem? Is is anyone getting you know cracked down on? Like, how does this get better over time? Because it, it sounds like this is probably like hundreds and hundreds of years old tradition yeah it's you know, unfortunately like it's super hard to break so like yeah the hard part is it's we think progress is being made but then they go two steps back so just recently i was in february i was in spain to attend one of the protests that spain was actually now introducing a new animal welfare law so it was actually the way it was written was going to be a very good law saying that you know uh, no pet shop could actually sell dogs. It could only be through adoption groups. Uh, in order to own a dog, you actually had to go through training. Uh, no dog could be euthanized without going through a vet and verification of why it needed to be euthanized. And you actually had to have insurance for the dog. But what happened was the Federation of Galgaleros uh, got wind of it and uh, lobbied the uh, parliament and got the hunting dogs removed from it. So the hunting dogs lost all rights in Spain. 
So they pretty much have no protection again. So that's been the ongoing thing is they've uh, been pushing that. And unfortunately, February 9th, I believe it was, it got passed and hunting dogs were excluded from it. And most likely it will not be revisited for a long time because Spain's already considered this as a great law that's made great progress. But once again, you have the dogs that truly needed the protection were excluded from it. That's got to be super frustrating to get that close and then have the one oh, yeah. group of dogs. And so these dogs are hunting hare, so like large rabbits? Yep. So it's they'll do hare, and sometimes they've been doing uh, lure coursing, straight line lure coursing. So, but it's all out in the rural areas that, you know, it's really not much protection. Unfortunately, most of the people, the politicians, policemen are hunters also. So they kind of will protect their other fellow hunters. And there's towns in like uh, Flint Salida is one of them that it, hunting is so intertwined in the city. Uh, they even created a statue for the Galgos, for the uh, champions of the open field. And as you go through the town, you'll see on the garbage pens, a bunch of blue bags that people in the town will kind of separate their bread from the garbage so the hunters could feed their dogs bread instead of actual nourishing food. But last time I was there, as about half a mile outside of the town is a dumping ground where we found five dead galgos and dogs in garbage can and bags just dumped out there. And about a mile away, we found three dead galgos in a uh, abandoned well. So this is the one thing that it's, you know, it's confusing that you have this town, the statue in the middle of your town celebrating these dogs, but you're still dumping these dogs in a field, feeding them bread when you say you want them to be the champion, but you're not even giving them nourishing food. So it's it's just those kind of mortality or uh, mentality that they have. And one of the superstitions that they have is the more the dog suffers, the longer, the better the, or the, sorry, the more the dog suffers, the more prosperous the next hunting season will be. So that's why they will hang the dogs. Uh, they will inject them with bleach, put uh, metal bars into their mouth so they can't eat and hunt for themselves when they abandon them. So it's just a lot of these odd things that they have, that they do. It's just like we've not been able to figure out why that that mentality is like that. That is so heartbreaking. Um, it's got to be almost like a thankless job, you know, doing this sometimes. So, you know, what does the next like year or two years look like for you? What what do you guys have planned to kind of keep this uh, keep this going? Once again, it, I'm trying. The nice thing is I'm kind of getting office to be able to kind of speak. I'm going to be at imaging, so I'll be a platform speaker at imaging in January. So once again, anyone wants to learn more, I'll be kind of going over a lot more of this, uh, having those opportunities, doing these podcasts to spread more awareness out. Uh, there's a lot more protests going on in Spain. Uh, the nice thing is a lot of the people in the cities were not aware this is happening. And more and more people are coming out to these protests. In February, when I was out there, they had protests in 40 cities within Spain. And, you know, in Madrid, there was about 2,000 people there marching to add, to add the dogs to the... Uh, new animal welfare law and to ban hunting with dogs. Right now, Spain is the only country that allows hunting with the dogs. So it's, uh, so we're forcing with that, uh, continuing just raising awareness. Uh, we got quite a few groups trying to push the laws for that. But once again, it's a political issue that the hunters have a very big lobbying uh, power so they could help force a lot of their laws that they want, even though most of the people in Spain do not agree with it. You know, right now, Spain, 85% of that land is used for hunting. And it's a $5 billion a year uh, industry just for hunting. So instead of, you know, businessmen going to play golf, you could go to Spain and go shoot things if you want. So that's kind of what they've been setting Spain up to be. Yeah. So these dogs, are these dogs catching the rabbits or it, they're like traditional hunting dogs? So they're just like kind of bringing them out and then hunters are shooting them with 
some sort of like shotgun. Uh, basically what happens for these uh, competitions is they'll have two dogs and they'll have a group of people walking the fields to flush out a rabbit or a hare. Once the hare is released, they release those two dogs. So the two dogs will chase down the rabbit and they have three people on horseback that follow the dogs and will grade the dogs. So it's not a matter of who catches the rabbit. It's a matter of the dog overtaking the other dog, causing the rabbit to change course, and at the end, who catches the rabbit. So there's a couple of things that could happen. If the dog has uh, hunted quite a few times and it's learned that he cut the corner to catch the rabbit, he's considered a dirty galgo, and that can get the dog killed. So they want the least experience because it's more entertainment. So there's a lot of those things that kind of happen with that. So the judges will follow the dogs and if they, they'll grade the dogs of how they're running and so forth. And they want the dog to run no matter how tired it is to keep going. So I think it was 2016 to 2017. The one, there's only been two goggles that have won the championship twice. The second time, the one that did win twice ended up winning, but died at the end of it it ran itself to death that i so this whole time i was thinking that these dogs were being used by farmers to like you know hunt these rabbits and then like feed people but this is completely different this is just for sport right and seems yeah there are some that will still use to kind of feed the families things like that but most of it is now for competition so they have each town will be able to kind of pick the the uh best ones in their town and go to what's called the King's Cup. And that is where the, the like the Super Bowl of the hunting is. So have you reached out to, I guess, whatever organizations are putting on this competition to, you know, see what their thoughts are and like, it, oh, is awareness. So like they know what they're kind of encouraging. Yeah, I've tried that multiple times. I get no reply back. I've tried to go to the competitions. Uh, the shelters won't take me because they tell me it's way too dangerous for me to be out there with a camera and being a foreigner. So uh, even uh, my friend uh, Yere, who did the documentary, uh, when he did the documentary, they thought he was one of them. But now they've learned he's he had to leave Spain because he was getting so many death threats from them. So uh, it's it's kind of a very interesting dynamic for that. And there's been cases of you know, two galgaleros getting in the fights and one coming out with a couple stab wounds and police not doing much about it. So. Oh, this is heartbreaking. So is there a, is there a place for people to, you know, go donate if they can't adopt one of these dogs? Like how do people get involved to, to kind of help you do what you do? Uh, a lot of it is spreading awareness. There's quite a few groups in Spain that you can kind of follow and kind of help share those stories. Uh, one of the main ones I work with is uh, Benjamin Mainhart Foundation. I also have like Galgo del Sol, uh, Bass Galgo. I could send you links for those that you could add into the uh, link. Uh, the, also, February 1st is World Galgo Day. So it's a Dia del Galgo. Oh. And it's another day where everyone gets together, kind of flood social media with this, can help raise awareness. Uh, FBM America is uh, another group we kind of work with to help where you could donate and that goes directly to Benjamin Mainhart in Spain. So a lot of this, if you travel to Spain and are interested in escorting dogs back, we can help you with that. Uh, it always has to be a direct flight and certain airlines to do that, but we're able to kind of use those escorts to help bring dogs back. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of things you could do if you wanted to do a volunteer vacation. You can go out to Spain, spend a day in a shelter, doing photos. You know, if you have certain skill sets of social media, you could help with that stuff. So there's a lot of things that can be done. It's just kind of knowing what those skill sets you want to offer and how you could help with that. Yeah. Um, well, happy to keep helping uh, this cause, Travis. I, yeah. I love that you're doing this. It's a, such a noble uh, thing to do that you should be really proud of. And I'm sure everyone watching is either in tears or yeah. finding a way to, you know, figure out how to help because dogs yeah, are the best. Oh, they are. And it's, it's amazing. It's, you know, talking with all the people of who've adopted them, of 
you know, how abused these dogs have been, but how much they want that affection. They love that affection. And we've had quite a few dogs that have become therapy dogs. Now we have two in New Mexico that are pretty famous in New Mexico. They work in the uh, prisons, uh, hospitals. They also work uh, with uh, girls that have been sex trafficked and kind of help bond, help with a bond and help them with the counselors be able to kind of speak and explain their situation because a lot of time they're, they have PTSD and they are not sure of the counselor. So they end up talking more to the dog than to the counselors. So the counselors sit, sit in the background this listen to those conversations as they're binding with the dog. So it's those things that kind of is amazing to see too. Yeah. It's very moving. Um, I mean, dogs are magical creatures that, you know, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's man's best friend. <laughs> so that's, you know, the old thing is, you know, dog backwards. So. Oh yeah. No, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I never thought of it that way. Yep. Um, well, I really appreciate your time. I look forward to uh, catching up down at Imaging. Um, if you can find some time to, to oh, yeah, meet up. definitely. Love to come uh, listen to you talk and uh, go from there. Sounds good. Once again, thank you. I greatly appreciate the time and uh, greatly appreciate the video you guys have been putting out. Great classes. So thank you again for that. It's been great to have you as a part of our community for you know sure. the last several years. So yeah. uh, your support is much appreciated. So. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. This podcast is officially over. See you next time. Catch you a little later on down the trail, dude. Thanks for listening. I get out of here and start shooting. I can remember very distinctly one of the very first classes. You had to take um, one roll of film and, and tell a story. And you got, you know, four by six prints made of them and you put them on the wall. I remember watching some of the people's images go up on the board and being like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? These people are so talented. I was a DJ. I worked a lot at night. Sort of felt that itch to do something else. And after some soul searching, the only thing that I was excited about doing was taking pictures. And I, I would Photoshop myself into other places. And a lot of times it never even went online. I didn't care because it wasn't for necessarily the world. It was because I wished I was anywhere other than where I was. I suppose academically I failed everything, so I was left with very few choices. Uh, I was cater waitering. I'd work till you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night, retouch until three or four in the morning. Even though I didn't really have the talent, I'd be willing to work when other people would sleep. And at times I look at my work and I think, damn, I'm a shitty photographer, fuck, it's nothing. You know, you have this idea of what can be done because you're assisting and you just can't Create it. You know, so often today as artists, I think we get ideas and we end up sitting on them and we don't follow through. I think we're our, we can be our worst enemies. I will talk myself out of a project before I even begin it because I think about all the things that might go wrong or could go wrong. When you first start out with doing anything, you know, you've got like five people, you know, one of those is your mum following you and it's just like difficult to get accurate feedback. You have to be willing to be rejected by the artwork, by yourself, by your peers. We get worried what our peers are going to think. We get worried what the talent is going to think or what the celebrity is going to think. And for me, it was always like, I understand that, but I also understand that you have to be passionate enough to throw the excuses aside and just start the process. First struggling, then assisting full-time for three years, then struggling some more, then retouching, freelancing, getting my first job. But I'll lay in bed and something will just pop in my head and I just go, what if? Wouldn't it be interesting if? Try it, it didn't work, throw it out. Try it, it didn't work, throw it out. Try it, it works, it works, it doesn't work, throw it out. You know, you don't become a great photographer, you don't become a great painter, you don't become a great sculptor without having some downfalls. And, and, and going in the wrong direction. I allow myself to fail because I like to fail because I like to grow. But you have to decide that you want it because it's not easy to be great at anything. Even though I'm not at the place I want to be, I'm still moving forward. Nobody's going to love everything that we do. But I think you have to take a chance.